welcome to the month of October's History for Lunch. We are happy to have everyone joining us today, and especially Mrs. Wagner, who is coming all the way to us virtually from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, Mrs. Wagner is with the North Carolina Archives, and I'm going to let... Um, I'll let Mrs. Wagner explain a little bit more about her job responsibilities because she um, state markers, which we have quite a few here in Passwatank County, but she will um, be discussing with us her, the book, This Day in History, This Day in North Carolina History. And we do have the books available in the museum shop. And actually, the staff have been looking at them, and there's several staff members that are going to purchase them for Christmas gifts. And it's a great Christmas gift. Yes, yeah, and in fact, they gave me the idea for a few Christmas gifts also this year. So um, please, if we happen to sell out of the books, I'm sure Miss Mary will be ordering more, but they are available in the museum shop. So, Mrs. Wagner, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And just before I turn it over, if you have a question, if you will chat the question, um, type the question into the Q&A or chat, and we will answer the questions at the end of the program today. So, Ms. Wagner, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay. All right. So, yeah, as, as Lori mentioned, I... My day job, my usual job now, is the administrator of the North Carolina Highway Historical Marker Program. And um, the This Day Project came along before I was managing the markers, but it's the marker program is, is big in this office, and we're the research branch of the Office of Archives and History. And so altogether, my career in, in, this, in this office has just been short things little short snippets and tidbits of North Carolina history, because that's what the markers are. Um, and that's what these, um, the This Day essays are. So what I'm going to do is just kind of tell you how this whole book happened, because um, I think it's a pretty, pretty neat story. And it's, it, it just highlights so many interesting things that we have in North Carolina history. So before I start anything, I'll just go ahead and tell you what happened today. And that is a really big one in North Carolina history on October 7th uh, was the Battle of Kings Mountain. Um, so that's, that's just a really key big story. We actually, when there was such a, a big story like this, the, the blog ended up running for four years, but um, there's only two topics for October 7th, this and the world's fattest twins. <laughs> who were from, um, I think they're from Haywood County, and they're actually much more modern at times. Uh, my old boss actually went to one of their funerals, um, but they um, were famous for riding tiny little motorcycles. Um, so Battles of Kings Mountain, that's the one we'll, we'll, we'll stick with for today. So the blog started as an idea that was launched in July of 20, 2012 and it, that was when we first started working on it but they quickly decided that they wanted us to start running the blog or the it was going to be a blog and a com the, the main thing was really that it was going to be read on the North Carolina News Network they wanted a two-minute little blurb of North Carolina history so two minutes that comes to 200 words max so we had July, August, September, we had two months to start trying to produce these little stories. And if, as you can imagine, the, 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 the bulk of the work really was finding something for each day. And so we, we had to figure out, you know, we, we initially planned this massive database. And the one thing we pulled from quickly was the historical markers. Um, so we, we plumbed the database looking for um, dates related to historical markers. And then the other really easy thing that we filled in for those early, the early period um, of doing the, the this days was the birth and death dates of governors. Um, my joke as, as the 
project went on was that if a day features the birth or death date of a governor, you know that there was just nothing else much for that day. Because we tried. It's kind of boring to have a birth or a death of the governor, but it does allow you to tell the, the important stories of, you know, what, what they accomplished in their, in their work. Um, so like, as I mentioned, when we started trying to select a topic for, for each day, um, it was more like an advent calendar because, you know, we didn't have this massive database that we could just go to. Sometimes we had to, um, you know, just, find something for that day. So you had, you know, September the 5th, what happened on that day? So it was kind of like opening the little advent calendar. Um, so as, as you can see here, you know, it was kind of complicated. We would go through and, and we would have some things and you'd go through and, and try to find something that happened on that day. Um, one of the things I started doing early on was I would take a day, so say September 15th, and then North Carolina history in quotation marks. And then I would just come up with words like established, founded, opened, discovered, escaped. And I have to admit to it, murdered. Murders were big. Murders were always popular this day topics, killed, murdered, um, things like that. And, and we would try to we would do regular Google searches and, and uh, Google book searches. And one time when I was trying to find something for September 21st, I just discovered William B. Gould escaped slavery on September 21st. And it, that, was, that was early on and, and it really led me to the, wow, we can find really neat stories by doing this. Um, so, another thing that we did early was to, fill in dates with um, products, the, the, the really interesting, famous products from North Carolina. Um, we have a lot of cool things that were developed in North Carolina. Every year, Bojangles is one of, Bojangles and Pepsi are the biggest, most shared things we ever do. Um, Vicks Vapo rubs right up there. People love, love to tell the stories of having Vicks VapoRub rubbed on them somewhere by, you know, some grandmother to treat something. Um, everybody's had it done. Um, so if th those are, are really popular and it's, it's fun to think about them, you know, having been developed here in North Carolina. Um, so we tried, we tried, that was another one of those kind of backdoor things that didn't help us right at the beginning because we were trying to fill in, we had to fill in something for every day. But then as we had a little bit of padding in the years, we could go back and say, well, hey, we haven't talked about cheer wine yet. Let's find a date for cheer wine. Um, and then you would just try to find either the date that a patent was issued or that the company you know, was established. Uh, or I think for Mount Olive Pickles, it's the day that they were incorporated. Another bountiful pot for us to draw from are North Carolina's famous um, artists and personalities, um, you know, Ava Gardner, Andy Griffith, for Andy Griffith, we've, we've got a couple, we've got the first, in fact, it was just recently the, the anniversary of the first Andy Griffith show, but we've also got one of our other really popular days is, um, the day that he recorded what it was, was football, and that, yeah, that's a great thing, um, Nina Simone, Lots of, lots of really cool musicians to, to talk about. Military, sports, um, politicians, you know, those were all easy pickings for, you know, finding a, a date related to them. Um, you know, Michael Jordan's birthday, things like that. Some days were really difficult to tie into a North Carolina story when you start Googling for, you know, November 19th, there really wasn't that much that happened, but you keep coming up with the Gettysburg Address. So I went through a back door and tried to find a North Carolina connection to the Gettysburg Address. And what I found was this professor at UNC Asheville, Chris Oakley, who examines photos. He's, he was actually, I think, a cartoonist at Disney or something like that. 
but he, he examines photographs for, you know, to try to pick out people in them. And he was, um, you know, he found this image of Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address that people didn't really, had never caught that Lincoln was in it before. There's that, the one image that everybody had seen, but he found Lincoln in this bigger picture here. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the story. It, it's it's kind of convoluted, but it was a way to get something related to North Carolina for, for November the 19th. The worst day of all time for my, I will never ever forget December the 19th because I spent, I think my best guess is about eight full work days trying to find something that happened in North Carolina on December the 19th. And I could not find anything. But I kept coming up with, the, it was the day that Washington's troops encamped at Valley Forge. So finally, I, I mean, I even called Valley Forge and said, do you guys interpret anything related to North Carolina? Is there a North Carolina story? And they, they thought it was a really neat proposition, but they couldn't find anything. And then I finally found that, um, William Polk was there. <laughs> so there you go. It's, it's a stretch, but North Carolinian William Polk encamped at Valley Forge on that day. So the long story being, you know, we, we developed this blog. It went for four years and um, it's still going. It's not, it's not new products. We're not coming up with new, new topics really, but we still have it out there for people. Um, but we decided that it was kind of silly to take these little essays and, and just not do anything with them. I wanted to do a coffee table book. Um, so I had to find images for things. You know, we wanted it to be a coffee table book with lots of pictures. There actually had been a previous this day in North Carolina history type of book but there were almost no images in it at all. It was truly just story after story after story. And I, I think for this kind of thing, people want to see pictures. So I started looking for pictures. And again, it was a lot like the early, the topics for the book. There were the low hanging fruit. There was the historical markers, um, pictures from the state archives and, you know, lots of pictures of governors. <laughs> Um, you would think that the North Carolina businesses would have been also really cooperative and easy to get things from, but they weren't. Um, and I will, I will always call out, um, Carowinds because they did not, they would not send me, you know, I said, just send me a picture of, of a, you know, roller coaster or something. And they, they never, they never cooperated, but my two favorites were, um, the land of Oz and Texas Pete. Um, I actually got to trying to find an image for the Land of Oz about the week after they had closed. You know, they open each summer for about two weeks. And I caught them right after they had closed the shop for the, the, the year. Um, but the guy who runs it immediately sent me several classic Land of Oz images, which was very exciting. And the Texas Pete folks went through their archives to find um, some fun images and, and I just love that one. Mount Olive Pickles sent several and then um, Thomas Built Buses is, is actually owned by Mercedes or Daimler now, Daimler Trucks. And um, they sent me some cool pictures. I really like this one. And I think we're blocking, our, our pictures are right in the way, but it, it actually, there's a sign here that says um, Thomas Built Buses right next to that um, school bus. So I thought that was a great one. Um, and as I collected the images, there were lots of stories that made you say, you know, what did that look like? Yeah, there, 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 there were stories in, in the, the blog that you just you had to have an image for them. So those became the real challenges. Um, one of my favorites was Buffalo Child Long Lance. And I will tell you that this was, this was, the most expensive picture that is in the book. He, I had to pay $40 for that picture of him. Um, this gentleman here, he was 
um, the, one of the most famous Indians in North America in the 1920s, and he wasn't an Indian at all. He was a, a mixed race African American man from Winston-Salem. But early on, people told him he kind of looked Indian. He had some Indian looking features. So he decided to run with it and he became a famous Indian. So you think, what did that look like? You, you've got to find a picture of him. But it was really hard to find a picture of him in the, um, you know, in the free to use zone. So I, I ended up having to pay the Atlantic Journal Constitution $40 for that one. Uh, but you can't have that one in there without a picture. You know, Lady Olga was the, um, considered by many to have, to be the world's greatest bearded lady. You know, you kind of know what that looked like. Um, and then um, more famously, if you're familiar with uh, Spaghetti, who was the um, embalmed corpse of Concetto Farmica, he was killed in, um, a fight in a circus in South Carolina and they brought him over the border into Laurenburg where he was embalmed and his dad came by and put a down payment on this the embalming and the casket and everything but then never came back so the the funeral home actually displayed his body for many many years and um, I was actually you know I I thought it was a fine picture. It was actually supplied by the McDougal Funeral Home, but in the end, I was overruled by my bosses. Um, and the McDougal Funeral Home was kind enough to send me a few other alternative images, which were nice. And that was the uh, the receipt from um, the, the 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 partial payment on his embalming, and then his ultimate. Um, gravestone, which you can see. He died in April of 1911, and he was buried in September 1972. North Carolina is home to three sets of conjoined twins, and again, that's definitely one, you know, where people say, you know, what, what did that look like? Um, so we have Ang and Chang Bunker, Millie, Christine, McCoy and Daisy and Violet Hilton. I was able to find images of all of them. You know, the American Streaking Society. <laughs> you gotta have a picture of that. And the, the greatest thing about this one, um, you know, we all know what that looks like, but let's have a, a picture of it actually happening. And this was in fact, taken by one of the archivists, librarians at Chapel Hill. Um, when he was in school there in the 70s, he walked out of the library and there were some streakers going by, classic. They're wearing their uh, hush puppies and nothing else riding on the back of their Volkswagen. So I was really excited to get that picture. I was almost overruled on this one, but they finally let this one go. Another one that you just wonder, what did that look like, was the, the story of the first x-ray in the South. It was taken by Davidson students who broke into the lab and used the x-ray machine that they had gotten before the professor even got to use it. And they um, had a cadaver finger, which you see down here at the bottom, where they poked some things through it. Um, and what else did they have? Yeah, I think it's a bullet and some needles and things like that, magnifying glass. But, you know, I was really excited to get this image from Davidson College because you definitely want to know what that looked like. One of the things that I found was really cool when I was looking for the Love Valley Rock Festival, an image from that, um, it was this one year they did this rock festival in Iredell County and as I was looking into it, almost all of the really cool images were taken by this guy named Ed Bazell. And I thought, well, let's just give it a try. It's a fairly unusual name. Google him, found him living in Charlotte, and he uh, sent me some great pictures. What a great picture that is. Um, so yeah, I was so excited 
um, to have found him and that he shared. So Popcorn Sutton, um, I needed a picture of him. He was really the best option for the day. Um, but, you know, he was an outlaw. There are not many pictures of, of Popcorn Sutton um, for a reason. And I spent a lot of time looking and looking and looking. And then I found this professor at State who um, did a video called The Last Damn Run of Liquor. Um, and he created a, a documentary called Popcorn Sutton, Hell of a Life. And th I just found this. He had done this as a image for the, the documentary and found it on a website through NC State and contacted him and he said, sure, just give me credit for it. Um, so what a great picture that is, of Popcorn in his still. Another person that, that I wanted an image of, Eric Rudolph, when he was captured up in the mountains, they were all Getty images. And I don't know if anybody on here has ever had to deal with a Getty image, but they are really, really expensive, like $5,000 a piece. Um, we just can't, couldn't do that for this book. But I knew he was, he was arrested in North Carolina. There's going to be one image that's not a Getty image, and that's his arrest picture. And I called up to the Cherokee County Sheriff's Department and they just seemed so surprised. They, they just didn't understand why I would want it, why that they should have to give it to me. And I said, no, it's ma'am, it's a public record. You, need, you can send that to me. Um, so I finally did get that one and I was very excited to be able to have an image for that one. So not everybody who was hard to find was a criminal. Um, Elizabeth Keckley, was, a Mary, was Mary Todd Lincoln's dressmaker, and she was a slave in Hillsborough for several years. Um, that's her connection to North Carolina. But I had a really hard time finding an Im image of her. The Smithsonian has some dresses that are supposed to have been made by her, but I couldn't get them to share their images of the dresses. And again, just in churning through the internet, I found an archivist at Howard who had written about Keckley and um, we went kind of round and round and she kept thinking initially that I was going to pay but again they had you know it was going to be something like $80 for this picture and I finally said well thank you but we're not going to be able to use it and she said oh never mind go ahead <laughs> just go ahead and use it and give us credit um, so again I met a lot of really nice people who when they understood the the enormous number of pictures I had to find um, that as long as they were getting credit for it, they, they allowed me to have images. Um, this was an amazing connection that I made um, for one of the This Days. Um, Mary Dalton was a woman who spent her entire life in an iron lung, and one of the days was, you know, the day she was diagnosed with tuberculosis and um, I found this woman, Martha Mason, who had done um, a, a video, a documentary about life in an iron lung and this fabulous picture that she shared with me of her interviewing Mary Dalton. The, the mini page, you know, what a great thing that most of us, a lot of us of my age, the 50-ish age year person, uh, remembers the mini page. And I had a really hard time finding a, a, a picture that wasn't, you know, copyrighted as the mini page. Um, and then I found this photographer from Chapel Hill who was willing to share pictures of his visit with her in her office. And I, I, I just thought this was a great picture, uh, something that's not going to be, it's not the usual picture that you see of her or the mini page. Soul City, um, when I was first looking for pictures for Soul City, they were all modern pictures of the abandoned facilities. Everything looked really run down and old. And I, I struggled with that because that, that's not what I wanted. I, it, you needed to have it contemporary to the time. And, and I actually found a blog post at the National Archives um, that featured this, this great picture of Floyd McKissick and Kemp Talley at um, the early, you know, in the early planning stages for Soul City. 
And for this day in September, um, the, really the only thing that was going to be an option for an image was the, the sinking of the um, SS South America, Central America. And, you know, it, it's, a, it's just a, a ship that, that wrecked. But the, the thing about the shipwreck was that it, it ended up causing like a, a worldwide money crisis because so much of the world's gold was on that ship and it went down and you know markets crashed it was it was an early financial crisis um, that was caused by this shipwreck well i found that there was a, a group of i'm gonna add, it's a hard word for me to say new new numismatists numismatists uh coin collectors who um had a collection of the double eagles from that shipwreck and he um shared the image with me for free. They're actually in a tank still um, to keep them anything from happening to them. It's always a huge bonus to me when I found a picture from the actual day. Um, so not just a picture of George Preddy, but I got a picture of him on the day that on August the 6th, 1944, which was the day he shot down the six enemy aircraft. And here he is like signing off his, after he's come in, he has to sign off on, on what he did and where he went for the day. Um, but he earned a Distinguished Service Cross for the work he did on that day. So then the big buildup, there was only one leap day during the course of our blog run. Uh, so there's only one story that we had for, for leap day. So I had to have a picture for it. And it was the high school, it was the longest high school basketball game on record. Harnett County's Boone Trail versus Andrew High School, 1964. Oh my gosh. So we were already at the point of looking at just clip art type of things related to Leap Day for this uh, post because we couldn't find for this entry in the book. And I wasn't going to let it go. I kept looking and kept looking. And I found a reporter from the Fayetteville newspaper who was doing a story on the Harnett, one of the two high schools was being torn down. And a woman went into the school and found the basketball uniforms that were worn by the kids that day from that team in boxes. And she washed them all up and cleaned them. And they were gonna sell them at an auction for the local boys and girls clubs. And there was this picture and it's the greatest picture. Uh, so I was really excited to have that. It's a great story. And it added a lot to the, the story um, that we ran for the, the, this day. As I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the, the presentation, I found William B. Gould who escaped from, escaped from slavery um, just through a Google search. When I came to looking for an image related to him, I was Googling William B. Gould and I found that there's a William B. Gould IV who was a law professor at Stanford and he was still alive. Uh, corresponded with him a little bit and he provided me with pictures of, of Gould, but we also started talking and decided that I, th I thought that if he would be a great topic for a historical marker, so he pursued that and um, now there is a historical marker about him down in Wilmington. He had been a um, plasterer at the Bellamy House in Wilmington. Another one of the great connections that I made during um, finding images for the book was Ernie Barnes, um, who was a painter and a football player who was from North Carolina. Uh, I was trying to get permission to use some of his, you know, one of his famous images or something for the, for the book. And I found his state and emailed one day and truly the next day I had a phone call from um, the executrix of his estate who sent me these pictures, but she also organized a meeting to come to Raleigh to talk with me and some other people about trying to get a, um, 
a, an art showing at either the History Museum or the Art Museum of his um, artwork. And she shared with me that the quote up there at the top, which just was devastating to me, she said that when he was 18, he visited the North Carolina Museum of Art on a field trip and was he asked the docent if there were any paintings by black artists and she said I'm afraid your people don't express themselves that way. So we thought it was really powerful to bring some of his paintings um, to Raleigh and uh, to put them in the North Carolina Museum of Art. Um, and you know I think a lot of people will recognize this image. It was on, um, it was at the beginning of Good Times. It was also the cover of a, the Marvin Gaye album. But I think everybody remembers this from Good Times. And whenever JJ's paintings were being shown, it was one of uh, Ernie Barnes's paintings. So the total paid for images in the book, we had 600 images and I paid $98.78 and 74 cents. <laughs> so, yay, I, I, it, it was a real um, adventure of, in North Carolina history and, and in learning um, how to plumb the world for, for great images that would, would help to tell the story of North Carolina history. Um, so I'm kind of proud of that. And that's about it. I hope somebody has questions. So um, if someone would like to, if you have a question that you would like to type in, um, I know we have the book here at our museum shop. And if you're not a local resident or you can definitely contact our museum shop. And I think they're on Amazon too, if I'm correct. They are and, and also through um, UNC Press. So you have three options if you would like to purchase this book. I think it's pretty interesting about the good times because I remember watching, um, growing up and watching JJ and good times and yes. never, you know, putting, so I think through this book, you can kind of make a lot of connections. Yes. That, and the book is just beautifully done. That was not my work. Um, that was our designer who did, you know, the layout of the book. Um, but every day just has the little 200, you know, the, the series of 200 word essays and then some just beautiful images. Um, you know, it's not meant to be, you know, a complete telling of North Carolina history in any way. It's really just a fun, go to, you know, your birthday, look up your birthday and see what happened that day or, or just keep it and look at it each day and, and see what happened. At the, actually, the, um, the soldiers on the current USS North Carolina, the one that's actually still out there, they they get to see a this day from the book, the page of from this day um, on their, I guess it's in their um, mess quarters. They show it on a big screen um, so that they can see what happened in North Carolina history each day. Um, so sometimes it's just kind of fun. I do have one question. Um, mm -hmm. What events people from Pasquale Tank County are featured in the book? You know, I would have to look in the, the index. Okay, let's see. I have the book, so maybe I can do that. Hold on, let me pull my glasses out. <laughs> <laughs> it's very small print. That was one, you know, to keep it from being just, you know, thousands of pages long. It, it's, it's a small print book. And again, when, the, the thing that I always try to tell people is if, if, if a topic or a place is slighted in any way in this book, it was not intentional. It's just that the way that it came about was that we had to fill days. Um, we never had the, um, the time to just say, you know, what are the really important stories in North Carolina history? We really did just have to say. Okay, so just um, just flipping through the book, we have uh, March the 30th, 1929, the federal government acquired the Dismal Swamp Canal for $500,000. So that would relate to our area. 
I just, um, and that's just because it can't, um, Haspel Tank was not mentioned in the index, but that would have been in our area. So I'm just. Yeah, the, the, we didn't, the index would not have be like, again, it, we, just, we didn't have the, the staff to go through and do each county and try to be comprehensive. If, if the word Pasqua tank wasn't in an essay, it's not, but that doesn't mean Elizabeth City isn't in, in one or something like that. So, like I said, I did find about the Dismal Swamp Canal just flipping through, but I'm sure there's quite a few other, I did see one back here. Uh, but yes, there, there are, there, Pasqua Tank County is mentioned in the book. So, do we have some more questions? And like I said, again, Miss um, Mary in the museum shop, she does have one of the books that she has taken the um, covering off of that she can flip, flip through if you happen to be in the um, museum because we are open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So Miss Mary is open. And as you can see, it is a rather thick book. This is not, it's a, it's much thicker than your normal um, tabletop book. <laughs> so it does have a lot of information in it. Um, the, like the um, Gertrude Well, I mean, we're getting ready to have a women's breaking barrier exhibit here at the museum. She's mentioned in the book. So there's quite a few I mean, there not there's not quite a few. There's a lot of history lot. that North Carolina for, has to offer. Yeah, I mean, for there's 365, 366 for one year, and then we've got the blog ran, and the you know the the North Carolina News Network ran it new, fresh for four years. So there's somewhere it kind of depends. Obviously, um, Leap Day only has one. Some days only had two, like today, October 7th's only got the world's fattest twins and, and Kings Mountain. But some days actually have five, because sometimes we found five things. Um, but it's between two and five pretty much for every day. Um, so there's a page for every day. And I think it's interesting because until we did a talk time a few years ago, um, I did not realize that VIX was a North Carolina product. So we did, and, and you would probably be surprised at some of the products that come from North Carolina. Yeah, we tried to get, that was kind of a last, last year or two of the, of the, the fresh run of it was we, we really tried to get in there and find the products because people love the products. Yes, they do. Okay, I do have another question. Um, could you talk more about the process you went through to find photographs for these events? What did that entail? So it was really a learning process. Um, I started with the state archives and um, gave them a lot of topics that I knew that they would have images for. Um, I also leaned on the history museum, the, the main history museum here in Raleigh for a lot of things, but really, thank goodness for the internet. I mean, I, I would, I would type in, you know, the subject that I was looking for and go into Google images and you find them. If I could find it, one of the things that was, um, that I learned, um, not too long into the process was that the library of Congress has free images. Um, that you can just go and download. Um, so I used the Library of Congress for things that I felt that, you know, I was pretty sure would be covered in the Library of Congress. Um, the universities were very good. Chapel Hill, East Carolina. Um, who else did I, I? I got several from Greensboro. So Every day was, you know, that it was such a chore. I spent about a year and a half doing the photographs for this book. So it was, you know, every day I would come in and what do I have for this day? And I'd sort of evaluate the topics. We would try to find, you had to find at least one image for the page. And sometimes it would be three images. Sometimes it would be two, sometimes just one, kind of depending on what we could find and what Sheila thought we could do with that image. Um, and, you know, I would pick the, 
target topic and then just start looking around either through a facility that I thought might have it um, or, you know, just start Googling things. And Google's a wonderful to tool. You know, I, I wish I could say it was more scientific and, you know, technical than that, but it, you know, I did, I did a lot of Googling. And like, that's how I found Buffalo Child Long Lance, you know, put it in quotation marks. The more things that you can kind of capture in quotation marks, Buffalo Child Long Lance, um, you know, image or, you know, image search, um, and you find them and then you contact people and sweet talk them, <laughs> tell them what you're doing and that, you know, you, you don't have any money in your budget to pay for pictures. And is there any way they can give you, you know, this, that they, you'll give them credit. Um, and just had good, really good luck. I think it's a 600 photos and it's been mm -hmm. less than $100. I mean, if you yeah. do the math, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, no, and, and Buffalo Child Long Lance was worth 40 bucks because you just have to, that is one. If you, if somebody reads that most famous Indian in America and he wasn't even an Indian, there's no way you're not thinking, what does he look like then? So, you know, you don't want people to have to go Google that. You just, you've got to provide those, those pictures. And you know, I've found too that a lot of people, if they have a story, photographs really help with the story. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And I, that's what, when Sheila did a great job with this book, just it, it's, it's pretty to look at, you know, you open it and there's just, sometimes there's these giant images that kind of wash into the story and it's really well done. I would even say that the book would be great for a young adult or a teenage style, maybe someone studying North Carolina history. It would be a great book because it's not something that they would look at and be, see lots of words and no photographs to go with it. Right. So, okay, do we have other questions today? We do appreciate the questions we did get. So again, um, the book is available in the museum shop. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday from 10 to 4. You can purchase the book for, from UNC Press, and you can also purchase the book on Amazon. But we would love to see you in the museum shop um, visiting okay. us. Again, we would like to thank Mrs. Wagner for joining us today all the way from Raleigh, and we would like to thank all of Oh, I do. We just had another question. Sure. Very interesting presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for watching. But anyway, we would like to thank you for joining us all the way from Raleigh today. And I think there's, to do it. there is this advantage to having virtual programming. Definitely. And I will plug, if you ever need one, I can, I have another program, a historical marker program. Awesome. We might need, we really need to look into that, especially, I believe it's, we have 14 markers here. I, if I remember from putting the stickers up, we um, have 14 markers here in past, I might be off by one or one less or one more, but well, I think it's 14 here in Pascatank County. And I think there's one that's still not up yet that I have not been able to order um, about um, Wilds Raid. Okay. And then um, the, I don't know if the soybean processing marker is still there, but that one is being replaced with a new marker that's that tell has more information on it. Um, so it may be in the range of 16, but yeah, there's a lot of good history in your area. So we'll have to look at that maybe next year of yeah. our um, historical markers. And you know, here at the Museum of the Abermont, we represent 13 counties as a total. So we could maybe even look at some of the um, surrounding historical markers also. Yeah. Again, the history for lunch, and I believe it's, let me pull that up right fast like. When you're sitting um, doing something virtually, you can have access to a camera a, um, calendar right quickly. So our next history for lunch will be on the 21st, where we'll talk a little bit of archaeology, and we'll have a presenter from the North Carolina's um, Department of Archaeology. So we're excited about that program because it is Archaeology Month. 
Again, thank you to everyone for joining us and hopefully we'll see you on the 17th. Thank you, Mrs. Wagner, for joining sure, us thanks. today. Everyone have a great day.